Welcome and thank you for joining me for this edition of Understanding Business. Today we are very fortunate to have with us special guest Matt Roloff. Uh, most of you know Matt from uh, the hit TLC reality television show, Little People, Big World. And uh, for those of you who are fans of the show, you'll know that Matt is an actor, an author, a farmer, an entrepreneur, uh, and a motivational speaker. I mean, he's got so much going on, and we're fortunate to have him with us today. We're going to be talking about a number of topics, uh, including overcoming adversity in life and business, how to develop your dream into a successful business, self-motivation, importance of big picture thinking, moving beyond mistakes and challenges, building a strong brand and customer base, and staying true to yourself. Now, before I introduce Matt, I just want to thank our sponsor. Today's show is sponsored by Audible, the leading provider of audiobooks on the Internet. And as you know, Audible has a massive library of more than 100,000 audio programs, and they're providing our listeners with ex an exclusive offer. Just head on over to audibletrial.com forward slash UTL radio, and you can download a free audiobook, no strings attached, uh, not too many things in life for free. So head on over there, get your free audiobook. I also want to remind you how important your feedback is because it allows us to provide you with the best guests and information possible. Uh, so let us know what you think about today's show and any of the other programs by posting on our social media pages. And again, all the links to those pages are located at utlradio.com. Uh, in addition, links to Matt Roloff's sites are also there. You can head on over and you can check out any of Matt's links directly on utlradio.com. Uh, and finally, if you'd like to ask Matt a question or join in today's discussion, please give us a call at 347-855-8831. Matt, I want to welcome you to the show, and I want to thank you so much for taking the time out today to be on the program and to talk about your life and business experiences. You're welcome, Peter. I'm looking forward to it. All right, so you know, most of, of our listeners, they're going to know you from Little People, Big World, um, but there's an overwhelming majority of people, especially in business, who I've, I've spoken to, who say, I don't watch television. So could you introduce yourself for those people that are not familiar with the show and, and give us a little bit of background about you before we get into the, the topics? Well, uh, let's see. Uh, we've been doing that show for it. It is, in fact, a little. We call, we describe it as a little out of the way show, and we think uh, that it's been going on for ten years, three hundred episodes plus, and still still doing more each year. We're still working on the epi number of episodes for this coming year, and they're actually look, looking out four years in advance. So they're they're planning on this show going on for a while. But it is a little out of the way show, and when we go through an airport, I, I estimate about fifty percent of the people. Um, know who we are, seem to catch eye contact and acknowledge us in some way that they know me or my wife or someone in the family. But there are the other 50% are people that, uh, you know, just don't watch enough TV to be to know this show. There's a lot of cable channels out there. TLC is kind of buried up in the higher numbers, and some people just haven't, haven't been able to see the show for one reason or another. And uh, those are actually the funnest people to talk to, people that aren't aware of the show. You get on an airplane and uh, began discussing. They say, "Well, what do you do?" And then you, I kind of smile because I know they don't know the show, which is which is great. That leads to a more interesting conversation. Um, and then usually by the end of the conversation, something comes out, whether it's another uh, passenger on the airplane walking by the aisle and saying, "Saying, can I take a picture?" And your your seatmate going, "Why do you want a picture of you?" Then you can explain, uh, you know, that you also do a television show. or or whether it's just something that comes up in conversation. But some people know the show, some people don't, um, and, and that's just perfect for us. It gives us a chance to have some notoriety out there and, and take advantage of that fact, but also be able to walk around with some anon uh, and anon anonymously. So for those people that don't watch the show and they don't know who you are, can you talk a little bit about yourself and your background and explain um, you know, who you are? Because, you know, there, like you said, there, you you got about 50% of the people out there that have never heard of the show or they've heard of it but haven't watched it. Uh, talk a little bit about yourself for a second. Oh, okay, uh, I can do. Uh, let's see, way before the show started, the show's actually kind of a new phase in our life. So way before the show started, I was selling building and selling software uh, systems into high-tech companies and joined a company up here in Oregon called Frequent about shortly after I got married. We got my wife and I, uh, my wife's a little person and myself, and we got married um, 
1987, I think it was, and we moved the family to Oregon so that we could build a big playground. I always had a propensity towards building elaborate play, play structures, so we moved here. I was selling software, doing quite well, and traveling around the country by day, but having uh, plenty of time off between my sales cycles um, to uh, endeavor in the backyard to make things like tree houses and pirate ships and castles and uh, at one point, the local newspaper cut wind of that, did a little article, and that led to a book that I published in 1999, an autobiography called Against Tall Odds, that was essentially about about me being a little person, having half my family being a little person, but it's time we had four kids, and my wife was raising them. She's little. And they, they liked that story, and that's when these reality television shows came through, and where the reality television people kind of read newspapers from all across the local towns all across the country. They have people hired that do nothing but read local newspapers from around the country. And they say, hey, this story looks interesting. So they sent a camera crew up to to um, just, you know, follow us for a day with a little, little mini handheld cameras, and they liked what they saw. Long story short, they asked us if they could, you know, help educate dwarfism by just following us around for a couple of weeks. Well, a couple of weeks has turned into a couple of years, which which has been fun, and we've enjoyed it, and we've had tremendous opportunity come from it, and an ability to you know talk, you know, be able to educate thousands and thousands of people about dwarfism. We think the notion that people go out on the street and tease tease little people as being midgets has really uh, faded away. It, the show has had a large effect because we've driven that fact home that little people deserve respect. They are humans and. There are, you know, proper terminologies to deal with people that look different than you do, and and using those ter- terminologies are, are terms of, of endearment. And and if you are in the know, and if you're knowledgeable, and ed, you know, ed, educate yourself, and then you can call people, you know, by labels if you have to use a label at all. You know, mostly call them by their name. Um, so we we feel like we've made a lot of progress uh, educating and. Uh, Educating the world. This show goes all over the country and all over the planet because it's distributed by Discovery. Um, yeah, little people, big world about the Roloff family living up here on a pumpkin farm, and we fight and we argue, and we sometimes keep a clean house, and sometimes we keep a messy house, and we <laughs> go on vacation and get along sometimes and don't get along sometimes, and we're just pretty real and just hanging out there, whatever's going on in our life. They try to capture and turn it into a story that you got, uh, the audience would enjoy. Right. Well, you know, what you said is so true as far as bringing awareness to dwarfism. I mean, when when you and I were kids, it was a different world. And, you know, people did not see little, pe- little people or people who were different the way they do now. I mean, my kids have grown up. They watch the show and they have a, a, an appreciation for the fact that everybody is a person with differences. No different, you know, whether you're tall, short, fat, skinny. And I think that the show has had a great impact on that. And, uh, you know, just the whole idea of bullying in general. When I was a kid, you know, you'd get a bully on a playground that would take your sandwich, and that's what you thought bullying was. And now it's it's kind of developed into this, this legal, um, you know, very confusing and uh, serious situation. So I think the show has done a great job for bringing awareness. Um, and, you know, it's got to be tough. I mean, I, I can't imagine having people invade your life like that and showing the good, the bad. Um, so I give you a lot of credit for doing it. I don't know how you how you do it. You know, because even well, with the def- opportunity, it's got to be tough. There's def- definitely been times when we wanted to throw in the towel and kick all the cameras out where it was rough, you know, and it's like, man, we can't do this anymore. And then there's other times where we really enjoy it. And those, you know, each of the kids and the family have taken a turn uh, – feeling like, ah, this is enough, you know, I'm going through my, you know, adolescence and struggling with this and struggling with my grades or struggling with my friends, and I don't want to, I don't want that covered on TV. So there's times when the kids don't want, that's that's the stuff that they want to capture the most in reality mode, you know, they want to capture, that's the stuff that's interesting to to the fans, the struggles, the difficulties in life, the things that come up, the adversity, the things that come up that aren't aren't uh, the way you want it to go, you know, and w- we've been we've been trained or conditioned over the years to, you know, regroup and think about it and really push ourselves to share the, the stories that 
aren't so fun to share and aren't as comfortable um, just as much as the ones that are enjoyable. Well, you know, the, the thing that is um, depicted on the show, aside from the reality element of it and that sort of uh, you know excitement that people get from seeing people fight, and, and that's just the way we are as a society, but if you look beyond that, you know, you can see you as a father and as a business person. And um, I think that, you you know, you're a very interesting guy because you have not had uh, everything handed to you in your life. You've had adversity and struggles. And if you go back and you know anything about, you know, your life from what you talk about on the show and in your books, you know you've had struggles and you've gotten to a place where you are considered by many people to be a very successful entrepreneur and business person. Um, Talk a little bit, if you would, about the struggles that you've had in your life getting to the point where you are today. Because I think it's important for people to understand that, you know, sometimes struggles uh, make people just want to give up and, 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 you know, shut down. Well, you know, that's one of my favorite speech topics when I go around and I talk. I talk a lot about pre-show um, diver- diverse, uh, and not just diversity, but resiliency is one of my favorite speech topics. And I talk about resiliency being a muscle. When you get beat down, if you can stand back up and walk forward and keep, keep going and get beat down again, and you get a flat tire, you miss an airplane, and it seems like the world is stacked against you, and you break a foot, and, and you have a physical complication in your health uh, profile... But if you can just keep on putting one foot in front of the other and marching forward with joy and, and happiness and, and rejoicing uh, that, you know, being thankful for the things that are going well, um, that builds up that muscle of diversity, uh, of uh, resiliency. And the stronger you can make that muscle, the more you can plow through the really nasty times in your life. So my childhood, way before the show started, I, I really like this question, um, Pete, because I think a lot of people feel like all my success has come strictly from the day the show came over, which right. was, uh, you know, sometime in 2004 or something like that. Um, well, before 2004, you know, we owned our big farm and had all our big play structures, our treehouse and our, and our thing, and that, that resulted from my successful software career. Um, and other ventures that we were involved in. But when I was a child, I was put in the hospital for months and months at a time, and, and they put you in, and you didn't get visitors, and it was like being in a little prison. And I had really, really painful operations, and I think I had got 12 or 14 scars up and down my leg. And I used to be put in these big tractions where they would crank on the thing and stretch me out to try to make me taller and straighter. And, and uh, very painful and very uh, not a good time in my life, but I... I was always still, you know, despite all that, a cheery, cheery uh, guy with a great disposition and, and um, always building things in the hospital, you know, asking for Legos and, and things that would be brought that would, you know, help help me keep my mind active and busy uh, in between some of these um, procedures that were uh, not, not comfortable. We played a lot of chess. And a lot of that chess, a lot of those board games, the nurses used to come in and mess them all up and destroy them. So time to go to bed and destroy our game, and we were so disappointed. We were in tears. But those games and, and the ability to, you know, let go of, of it didn't go the way we wanted because the nurses stopped the game and just when we were winning, all those were training grounds to have a spirit that, that has served me real well in my professional era because, you know, everybody knows, like in sales, for example, there's a lot of rejection and a lot of uh, being sent back to the drawing board and and uh, what have you, and those all build up that muscle that I talked about, that muscle of resiliency. And so I think some of the adversity that came into my life at an early age, um, I was able to somehow see the good in it and not let it drive me into complete uh, death, despair and depression, but instead to convert that energy into, oh, yeah, I'm building resiliency, I'm getting stronger, I'm, I'm, banking, I'm banking the lessons of life that are going to help me to uh, do more later in life. And I, I believe God has awarded me with, um, with just that. You know, he's, a, he's thanked me and awarded me for not being a whiny baby um, and not crying and feeling sorry for myself, but then people around me. They seem to reward uh, the fact that I... You know, yes, I can. Yes, I can. I got this done. I can do this. You know, this I've got this done. Not only encouraging myself internally, but encouraging the people around me with 
when you get to that point, when, when you're in my situation, disabled and walk on crutches and barely get out of bed and take care of yourself in the morning, but you're not only taking care of yourself, but you're cheering on other people around you to take care of themselves and to succeed in their businesses, that's when you really feel like you've, you've built your muscle up to a point where it's a, it's a valuable contributor to, uh, to society. Now, you know, you talk about something that I think is important to every business and every person because, you know, obviously you can't have business success if you don't have some personal success. Uh, you talk about what you're focusing on as you're, as you're a kid, and, you know, you're, you're going through these uh, terrible procedures. It, it's, it sounds to me like what you're saying is your focus was on positive. It was on things that were moving you forward. So how important do you think it is for people to focus on the positive and the good versus, oh, woe is me. How important is focus in your life? Uh, absolutely. Focus on the, for, uh, the, you know, the forward, manifest, you know, think about what it is you want and, and essentially manifest it forward, you know, by trying to figure out what the next steps are and applying those steps. Uh, you can waste a lot of time thinking about, you know, what could have been. I mean, there's always some, a cause for pause, after a, a, a failure, or a disappointment, to kind of reflect on it, boy, but boy, if you spend too much, more than a few minutes on that, and that m- time needs to go into manifesting your change going forward, and uh, thinking about what it is that where you want to be and who you want to be, what you want to be doing, and then taking the steps to do that, um, um, and you know that all starts in your mind. I, I have a saying that I often say when I speak. You know, it's um. It, it says, don't just, the original saying goes, watch your thoughts because they become your words. Watch your third words because they become your actions. Watch your actions because they become your habits. Watch your habits because it becomes your destiny. I like to say, craft your thoughts. Like, go in and literally use your mind to craft your thoughts that will help craft your actions and that will help craft your uh, habits. You know, for, in other words, form your habits to be what they want. Don't just let them, you know, just, just watch them. Don't just let them come about any which way, you know, but craft them, turn them, mold them into habits because the actions will become habits. And then it gets easy from there. Once you've got your habits, then, then things will become your destiny and become, in turn, become your, uh, um, you know, you, who you are. And um, so I... Um, talk a little bit about that and how making good decisions in your life and where to spend your time and you know you, people can waste a lot of time you mentioned you don't watch a lot of tv i don't watch a lot of tv you know that's a great way to waste a lot of time if you're not watching something that's less educational and productive right well you know i think what's important there is the fact that you are shaping your destiny and that's what you're encouraging other people to do as opposed to those people who believe that destiny is something that's predetermined, and it's based upon luck, and, oh, they have bad luck. Um, I mean, personally, I, I don't believe in luck. I believe in opportunity and being ready to accept that opportunity. But, um, you know, what do you tell people who say, oh, well, you were, you know, you, you're lucky. What do you what do you respond to people who say that to you? Well, I, I say the same thing you said, that, yeah, you know, okay, sure, it looks like I'm luck, but you know how much bad luck I had to go through to get to the good luck? Uh, so, in other words, uh, when actually, when I need a change or I need to do something different in my life, I typically look for the for some bad luck because bad luck typically is associated with shutting the doors, shutting the door, and that always gives you a new door to walk through. So, um, I think of uh, bad luck as good luck. But enough people say, well, you don't have any bad luck because what should have been bad luck for you, you actually converted it in your mind to good luck, and you went immediately searching for the new drawers that are coming out. And if people would not lay around and feel sorry for themselves on the bad luck and look at the good luck as, an, like you said, an opportunity, a new set of doors that are going to open up, a new new way to think about your problem, um, and then you can quickly convert that into good luck, and hence the bad luck was never bad luck. It was actually right. good luck because it drove you uh, to, you know, I know a, just a million stories from people who, you know, championship skiers who careers were cut short and they weren't able to ski anymore, and that's the end of the world. But they um, they didn't, you know, they went on and used that as an opportunity to open up new doors, and the new doors became more exciting. Actually, my story on that was I was working for a software company flying real high, 
and then they downscaled. This would have been back in 2000. They downscaled, and um, uh, and I was one of the ones that got a pink slip. It was kind of surprising. I thought, wow, you know, are they doing this because I'm a little person? And I had to take a day, a whole full day, to feel sorry for myself on that flight back home that from the East Coast. It was an East Coast company. And during that flight, I made a list of all the things that I still want to accomplish in life and still want to do instead of all the things that I was mad at and I was going right. to you know, be angry about. And by the time I landed on that plane, I was so excited internally to go after all these knocking on these new doors that are doors I really wanted to. And so the, the firing by one company turned out to be the best thing in the world and led directly to the TV show that we do now, which has been a godsend in terms of educating Americans and people around the world about dwarfism, which has been one of my goals and on my bucket list from the beginning of time. So I got out of a boring office job thinking that was a disaster and bad luck. And that ended up opening up the doors almost immediately um, to new opportunities that have been far more exciting and far more productive uh, uh, and and fun. Yeah. And had you wallowed in self-pity, you know, beyond the day that it took you to process it, you might not be where you are today. And that's so important for people to understand. You know, I have a question. That's, that's, that's absolutely I've, right, Pete. I have a question for you about, um, you know, when you were working with this company, the software company, as a salesperson. Now, you know, in the, in the business world, when you are in a service industry or selling a product, you're putting yourself on the line. You're putting yourself out there, and you cannot be uh, liked by everybody. Your product can't be liked by everybody. And so as business people, you know, we all face those challenges of rejection. Now, I hear it all the time from people who are completely capable of going out and doing something, saying, oh, but what if I get rejected? I want to talk for a second about you as a salesperson because you you are a little person, and you, here you are in a job where a lot of the sales, you get rejected right off the bat. Now, you've got you know essentially two strikes, if you will, against you. How did you muster the self-confidence? Just put yourself out there and to take that shot in sales. Uh, well, you you nailed it on the head um, with uh, the rejection. I would start by saying I had a lifetime of practice of being rejected, not just from be long before I even knew what software was. I was being rejected, not asked to be on the baseball team or the football team or, the, or go to the parties because of my simply because of my stature, people were afraid. Well, we can't buy him to this party. He might not be able to make it up the stairs, or he might not be fun. He might might not be able to dance. Whatever the circumstances was, or I've got he's got cats. He doesn't look like us. So rejection to me, just rejection on the schoolyard, um, in in the neighborhood, out on the street, um, you know, ran rapid in in my life. And so I learned to live with rejection. So when it got to be sales, it was a real natural migration for me because um, I did have confidence and I continue to have confidence, which is what, what you need, and I was also very callous towards rejection. Rejection didn't bother me. I didn't like it, so I wanted to do things and say things uh, to avoid rejection for sure, but if the inevitable rejection came, I was able to move on to the next client or, or to resolve the, the issues that were relating to the rejection in un unbelievably quick fashion. I was put on at one time uh, the, another sales team in another part of the country had gone out to this big gigantic company everybody knows them I won't mention the name but it's a big uh, uh, electronics company everybody that's listening to this has been inside one I'm sure once in their life but um, they had a big corporate um, software uh, project going on and my team had gone out there and visited with them visited with them multiple years and, and uh, for over years and they were being told, no, 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 we're going to go with a different company. We don't really like your company. And so my guy finally said, let's get Matt out there. Let's get Matt to go out there. So I was sent out on a mission to have a meeting. It was tricky just to get the meeting. I had already made a decision against us. Go out there and just one more time see if I could open their hearts and minds to our solutions and the way that we did business and, and talk to them. And uh, so I flew out there solo and cracked those doors back open and um, with, with you know, 100% chance of just being further rejected and more firmly being rejected, 
But instead, I was able to, you know, stretch that door back open, get it fully open, and we ended up winning that deal. We, you know, six months later, we were the, we were the, we had that account 100%. And so, um, and I'm sure that it was because of the, the adversity and the challenges I went through as a youngster and through my adolescence, being a little person gave me what I thought was a complete disadvantage. Every time I looked in the mirror, that's a big time disadvantage. But I was able to figure out how to, to use what I saw in the mirror and didn't like um, as something I could grow to like and use my my personality, my persuasive nature, the things that I learned naturally as being a little person um, uh, and, and apply those skills, that apply that um, um, resiliency and that and that uh, toughness and just outthink and outsmart and get up a little earlier and just try to convince those people um, that, uh, you know, we did have the best product and I was the best guy to to um, be listening to at that moment in, in, their, in their time. So um, I don't know if I answered all your questions with that, but I think it gives you yeah. a general sense of it. So now what would you say to somebody who is an entrepreneur and they've been considering going out, starting a company? You know, maybe they're working for a company and now they want to branch out and they've had this idea, but they've got this fear of failure and rejection. What advice would you give to them directly? Well, you know, I always believe in everybody doing an inventory, what's called an asset inventory of themselves, you know, and really sitting down and saying, is this, Am I, do I have the tools? Um, am I, what am I good at? What am I not good at? One, one thing I feel I've always been fairly good at um, is being able to assess where I need help, where I'm not skilled. I'm not good at, you know, X, Y, and Z, so I need to bring somebody in to help me with that. So I, I would always encourage people to be realistic. But, you know, with that being said, and realistic means to – you know, to understand that you're not the best writer, copywriter, marketing material, uh, graphic artist, or whatever it is, and you'll need to bring in somebody to help you with your pitch, you know, to provide additional energy that can work with your energy um, that can create a, a bigger boom. And um, so I see that a lot where people uh, don't surround themselves with people that bring out the best in them and that, that create a, you know, a full picture uh, to, to that that allows for success. So I, I think that's number one. But if you're doing something and you want to do it, you just have to do it. You have to figure out the steps. And if the step feels too big, like jumping off the cliff, well, then you need to start thinking about how can I take this step in in smaller steps, smaller bites. You know, maybe I don't want to jump off the cliff. Maybe what I want to do is lower myself down to that, the ledge down there with the, with the assistance of a rope. You know, and and and, or maybe I want to get a, a you know a, a kite, you know, and then fly off the cliff. So you, you just have to kind of rethink the problem until you're comfortable with what you're going to do. I mean, yet does it take guts? At some point, you're going to have to make a move, and you're going to have to just do what your instincts tell you to do. Um, but if if you're feeling like it's too too soon and it's too scary. Maybe it isn't quite the right time. Maybe you do need to accumulate some more uh, financial backing or search. Maybe you do need to uh, see people quit their good jobs all the time just unnecessarily when they can continue to draw that income. They just need to turn the TV off at night and spend a little more time on their new venture, maybe in the evening to get a little further along, get that first or second or third customer lined up before they you know, quit a job or what have you. So um, entrepreneurial is obviously a beautiful thing because you uh, – um, you know, get to make your own hours and you get to build something with your own hands and create a job and enterprise by yourself, but you also have to make sacrifices, particularly when it comes to your t- own personal time um, and what you invest. I, my early career in programming, I put in ungodly hours all day long. I would get up early and sometimes I wouldn't even come home. I'd sleep in the truck in the parking lot or on the floor of my office and, and get a shower somewhere, you know, in that right in the office, right. bathroom, or shower, and put those kind of hours in that were necessary. So people need to make those sacrifices to get their endeavors uh, rolling. Yeah, I think that's so important because so many people think, oh, you know, you, you fall into things and you're lucky and you're this and you're that. But people often overlook, especially young people coming up today, the element of hard work, it seems to escape them. And I think that, you know, Everybody that we have spoken to on this program and elsewhere who has developed success in their life has said one thing over and over again, and that is that it takes hard work and commitment 
to make anything become a success. One thing I want to touch on that you mentioned, you were talking about breaking down larger challenges into smaller steps. And, it, you know, figuratively, but in reality, viewers of the show have seen you do things like face a gigantic mountain and decide you're going to climb it, and you do it one step at a time. And I think that, you know, you can draw this, this figurative con connection between viewers who have seen you do things on the show that other people might have, uh, you know, shied away from. The mountain's too tall. The obstacle's too big. I, I can't do it. Yet you approach it in small steps and breaking it down. I think that people can see that. So I think that that's a very important thing, a very important lesson for people to understand. Yeah, absolutely. And, it's, it's, and it takes practice to be able to do that properly. And so if you start with smaller things in life that challenges that, you know, are just outside of your comfort zone and you go out and you reach them and then you do another one and here's something that's not quite obtainable, but I think I might be able to stretch and give up a few extra hours of TV watching and accomplish this thing. You know, I just go to a class. I mean, I just signed up recently. I have no time, busy as can be. I signed up for a, a, a Microsoft Excel classes because I felt like I could be more productive if so I could do spreadsheets faster. And sure enough, all of these opportunities to do now that I have the skills or somewhat skills, I'm able to get down and get spreadsheets done a lot easier from a one-day investment of, of class. There's so many things you can do to enhance your skills and to give you the power um, to do more and to be more, and that's just one example. So if you're not sure that you have the knowledge or the skills, maybe take a class or, or sit down and write. You know, it never hurts to sit down with a blank pad of paper and just write out your strategy and where you're going and what you're heading and draw a drawing that illustrates it and, and let that, that creative process guide you to your next step. Yeah, and it's never too late to learn. And I think the, the point you make with the Excel spreadsheet, the, um, the class you, you took, or the seminar, I think that even if you attain a certain level of success, you've got to be able to understand that there's always going to be something that you can do better, that you don't know how to do. So the learning process for successful business people never ends. It's an ongoing developmental Absolutely. process. You know, I think so many, times, so many times, Matt, I think Absolutely. people think to themselves, oh, you know what, I got this degree, I, I, I don't need anything else. And I think that that's such a huge mistake because they could tap into so much more potential if they would continue to learn. And that sounds to me like that's what you do. I, I Absolutely. I mean, I think I, I learned from a mentor years ago, never stop learning. And uh, he, he said never stop building, never stop learning, never stop serving, which, you know, means never stop giving back to your community, but never stop learning, obviously, and never stop building. Just keep building, you know, until you can't build anymore. Build enterprise, build... So that, that's the productive nature in me. You know, I'm very industrious since I was a little kid, but always trying to make something. Um, I heard read something the other day that Steve Jobs was laying on his hospital bed on his deathbed, and he was trying to figure out how to invent a new stand to hold the iPad because he was holding his iPad was laying on his bed. He was trying, to, you know, and that's a classic example of a successful person. You know, he was trying to sketch out a new iPad. Uh, that would make it easier for people in hospital beds to hold hold his iPad, and so um, that that resonated well with me because I, I realized that I tend to tend to do that as well. You know, it's just always trying to thinking of how to improve, and whether it be a product or a concept or a show or a, a scene for our show or a better pumpkin um, strand. Um, no matter what I'm working on, I, I'm constantly uh, you know looking for ways to improve um, improve on it. I want to talk for a second about big picture thinking because um, for those people who know the show, Amy, your wife, seems to be more realistic, practical, and you appear to be the big picture guy, the guy that does these things, comes up with these ideas. And, um, you know, I think it's important for those people in business to have some big picture thinking in their repertoire because without the big picture thinking, you you can't exist just on the practical. So talk for a second about, you know, do you consider yourself a big picture thinker? And, and let's talk about that for a second. 
I actually consider myself having the ability of, I consider myself very versatile um, is the first word that comes in, comes to mind. So my ability to go up big picture and then drill down from the big picture on what needs to be today's priorities and not get stuck up there because that's a bad place to get stuck. Um, but to be able to let your mind um, transcend from the big picture thinking to how does that translate into a task I can accomplish today, right now, you know, what phone call can I make right now that's going to support that big, you know, work in that big picture um, uh, direction um, is a very, is a powerful thing. So big picture, absolutely. Constantly I'm going, flying up to the 50,000-foot level, looking at how this fits into the big picture, how it works. And, and that, you know, that's I think that's something anybody's brain can be sort of trained to do. But you've got to comp- always use the big picture to calibrate everything you're doing. Is what you're doing today support, is it busy work? That's what I say to my guys. Is this busy work or does this support the big picture? And if it doesn't support the big picture, then it, we, maybe we should re- be thinking what we're doing. So I would imagine in your life you've had situations where, you know, you've had a big picture vision and you start doing it and you realize there's a problem, it's not working. Uh, talk about that for a second, because, you know, you started to mention that, and that's so important because so many times people in business will say, this is my, my goal, here's what I want to do, nothing's going to get in my way, and even where all the signs are kind of telling you, listen, you're, you're barking up the wrong tree, they continue to press forward, and they face ultimately failure. So talk about that for a second. Um, well, I, I can think of an example that may, maybe people can relate with, but um, because we're talking about big picture, it's so subjective on what size picture we're talking about. But our pumpkin patch, which brings in 30,000 people a year, um, for a number of years, during 2010, 2012, I had a big picture plan that because we're limited on, on our parking, uh, how many parking slots, we want to get people in, we want to show them it, uh, the, the country store, they could buy something, they want to get autographed from the family, they want to get on the hay wagon, and they want to go out and pick their pumpkin. And then we literally have an injecture and a, a shoot that after they weigh their pumpkin, it just sort of spits them back out in the parking lot. So the theory was, big picture theory, was we want our customers to come in and have their experience and go through blah, 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 step one, step two, step three, step four, and then back to the parking lot to get in their car and leave. And after an hour of staying here, they they would have a great experience, and we would um, have maximized the advantage of, the, of, of uh, that just because our farm was small and because of the constraints we have. Well, a few years later, I started realizing that that big picture plan was flawed in a number of ways, and we wanted to start to change, have people come in, settle in for the day, and stay the entire day. And start, so we start thinking about things like having a band that would, play at 2 o'clock and 4 o'clock. So people would wait around for that or having di- different drawings where the drawings happened at, you know, 10 a.m. and noon and again at 4 o'clock. So people that would drew in the morning could stick around and see if they got their prize got drawn. So we shifted our big picture plan based on knowledge about what was going to be the most successful financial model for the business. And people staying around, if we had added food carts and added food options and we fed them and we were getting a slice of that, you know, a percentage off of that, then that would that would be a better plan. So, you know, we dealt with, figured out the parking issue, which was driving us to the big picture plan A, and figured out how we could change the big picture plan B and solve the problem. So instead of being stuck in trying to refine plan A, we oh, let's just really stop and think. I know I made this decision. I know it was my philosophy a year ago, but let's look at what that would feel like to change our minds and flip our vision completely 360s and do it the other way. And everybody in the meeting was appalled because we had spent so much time and energy working on this plan, and now we were going to flip it to a completely new plan and uh, try to solve the the issues that were involved in that. But that's the kind of... um, agile thinking that has to go on in any business regardless of the size. You have to be a flexible company that's the leadership uh, and all the, the uh, lieutenants have to support the leadership change and um, you be able to prove that your company, even if it's the wrong change, 
but that it's flexible. Because if you can flip and do some, a change that's wrong, and all the employers can say, understand, ah, this is not a this is not a good idea. This company is going to turn this company in the ground. But the leadership has decided that's the change they want to make. Go along with it because then you can become part of the team that's agile and flexible and, and embraces the change that needs to go on. And then the next change that comes along, maybe it is the right thing. Maybe it is the, the secret sauce that the company needs, and you're going to be the first one to get called up to help uh, facilitate that change if you – you know, if you're open to it and you stay, uh, su- you know, keep a sunny disposition uh, about being a participant in that change. Yeah, flexibility, I think, is really a factor that so many people overlook. Uh, you know, Anthony Robbins, the motivational speaker, uh, once said, he gave the example of success in business is like an airplane flight from New York to California. You know, you start off at point A and you want to get to point B, but most of the time, 90% of the time, that airplane is slightly off course and you have to consistently make adjustments to the flight, you ultimately end up where you want to go. But it's a pattern of being flexible and adjusting. So I think that people often overlook the idea of flexibility. And, you know, I, I oftentimes I'll have an idea and then, like you said, you know, we'll, we'll go with this idea and then six months or a year later I say, wait a minute, I think I can do it better and then you've got everybody saying to you, but, but you just implemented this idea. Why is this no good anymore? And I don't think you should be afraid of flexibility and changing things. I think change in business can be good. Absolutely. Now, I want to talk for a second about uh, your, your customers. Now, you were mentioning the fact that you've got the farm. And uh, I mean, from, from people who know the show, the farm is astounding. Um, what a beautiful place. And you've got all these people now coming. Some of them are from the show, but I think that that there are probably just as many who come not for the show, not from the show, I should say, but because of the product and services you're offering. I want to talk about how you developed a client base. Because, you know, so many people, that's a question they have. If I start a business or if I have a business, how do I brand myself and develop a client base? How important is customer service? So talk for a second, if you would, about developing a client base. Well, we try to get people that come, and I think I think we're, we largely accomplish this. It's always hard when you have a lot of people. We train our employees very, very strictly that we are in the people business. I know you think we're in the pumpkin business, but we are in the people business. And when people come out, you know, we have certain rules. We try to be generous with our refunds. We try to make it extremely affordable. There was a time when we... Somebody said, oh, let's charge for parking, but did that one year, and we realized that, you know what, charging $2 for parking, parking yeah, we make an extra $50,000 this year. But you know what, it's so nice when people can come into the pumpkin patch free, for free, and they can park for free, and they can walk down to the pumpkin patch for free and mill about. If they want to purchase some of the extra things that obviously we have a business cost associated with, a more direct cost, then, then we need to, you know, charge them for that. But make it affordable. Um, and make it a good experience. So we have very, very few people that come up and to our information booth. We have a person that's available to answer questions and things. You know, and few people that come up and complain. Most, More often than not, they come up and say, I had a wonderful time. I'll be back next year. And we are getting less and less from our fans coming um, and more and more just from people in the community that work at Intel or Nike, and they bring their little ones out, and we set up a photo op area where it has a date printed on the wall. We change it every year. And we encourage people to get, you know, their annual photo, child photo, so they can, and they come up to us all the time and they say, hey, here's a picture I took back in 2009. My kid, look at him, you know, teenager right. now and playing basketball and you take a picture in front of the 2014 side, you know, and we, and so we have, we, we think about things like that to help us with our, we try to analyze our demographics as best we can without, stopping people and understand, but we're constantly thinking about what is the demographic age-wise, who's enjoying the farm, what can we add. We One example is we have a little area that we originally called the the fun zone. Well, now we call, we did a subtle little change that we call it the family fun zone. Because we realized that the fun zone was drawing in kids to pay the $8 to go have fun, but there was actually a lot of adult things in there that were fun too. So by calling it the family fun zone, 
we're able now to encourage adults to go in there and play with their kids and, and to have fun with their kids. So we've sort of made that subtle change, and it's financially been a real win for us because we've created an area. Not only well, not only the family feels good, the dad walks out and goes, yeah, I had a ball, I played with the kids with the slingshots, and we rode on the giant trikes, you know, afternoon. So instead of them sitting on the fence looking in, the kids having fun, they're actually in there doing right. it themselves. And and those are little changes that, you know, come to our attention and, and we say, Let's try it. Let's try that. Let's try that and then and then we you know, like it and and you know, adopt it as our standard business practice or we make changes and, and change it. So listening to the customer, it sounds to me, is extremely critical for you, listening to what they like and want, instead of just pushing your agenda of this is what we're going to do. Would you agree? Right. Yeah, and then we, you know, Amy and I have several other businesses as well. We're working on a, a food product business where we're, we've, Amy's cooked up some salsa options, and so we're working with some very large retailers right now to get this salsa. We had put on, we purchased up a couple of large uh, batch runs of it and sold it all out in the first couple of weeks of our pumpkin patch, and now we're busy uh, tweaking the recipe a little bit, and then based on some input we got, and we're going to do a couple little minor tweaks, and then we're going to do a couple big batch runs and get it out into the to the national store chain. So we're working on that business very actively. We also have a stool business. People have seen it on the show once or twice. It's a small little business. We don't feature it very often because the show doesn't tend to do things over and over again. They turn to do a storyline and, and then move on. But it's there, and it's shifted products to hotels every single day of the week and we have some of the parts made all over the country and assemble them and and ship them into hotels and so we got quite a demand in fact we can't keep those in stock either we, i order them up and think it's going to last for three months and the batch is gone in two months so we we we're busy running we have a full-time guy on that job and uh, uh, other outsourced people that do other pe- bits and pieces and so we're excited i'm going to be turning a lot of my attention to that business over the next couple of years we're um, also, you know, in deep discussions with TLC to, to continue to do more shows. And, and But fortunately, we've got some older kids now that can carry some of the weight, and, and uh, they, they, they're married, so we can get point the production people to spend more time with uh, the kids and doing their storylines and a little bit less time uh, here on the farm while we can go back to work on some of these projects that have kind of been on hold while we've been sh- our shoot schedules have been so demanding. Amy's involved in her speaking, where she goes out and does motivational speaking called Living Large, and she also has her charity foundation that she works to help kids, uh, kind of an anti-bullying theme to that, and teaching kids their own self-worth so that they don't feel like they the need to bully. And um, and I have a speaking thing as well, MRE, where I go out, or in fact, I'm going to get, Amy's on the road right now, and I'm getting ready to go on the road for a couple of speeches, and hold down the fart, we hold down the fort in the meantime, so... Um, we, we stay busy, that's for sure. <laughs> well, let me ask you this, because I'm sure this is going through a lot of people's minds. How do you manage your time to handle, because a lot of people can't handle one business or project, and you have, I mean, we've seen the stools, um, you know, you've you got Amy Salsa. How do you manage your time to do all of these projects? That, Pete, is an excellent question, and um, I it's a constant struggle, constant place for continuous improvement. I think about my time management several times every single day. I try to put tools in place, little, um, whatever online apps that I can use to track my time or just I'm very, very aware of the time. Um, tracking time is a tricky thing because it's so um, elusive. You, know, you can waste so much time. But I do think when I'm working on something and it's starting to take too long, I start, I'm start. i constantly um, reevaluating, is this task the right thing to be doing? And just because you're starting on task and you're getting there, there is this, there's a something to be said for focus and finishing. However, I'm one of these guys that looks at a task and halfway through it, I go, wait a minute, I could finish this task in two hours or I could abandon this task because in the big picture, it's not really going to put money in my pocket. And right. I and I do use that as a as a gauge. Is this a revenue-driven task? Um is this something that's going to make a customer happy and eventually make make me more you know have, put some finances in the in the kitty? And I want to train my employers to kind of think the same way. You know, are you working on a revenue generating a direct revenue generating task, or are you working on on something else? You know, cost task, and to be sure to balance that out. 
and that's where you got to balance it out. You, you know, it's not like you can't maintain your equipment and work on that. You won't be able to generate money if you don't have equipment that's maintained. But if you're spending six hours maintaining a tractor when you should have just sent it to the shop and had it fixed in two hours, that that's where I like my guys to question where our time is. And I pick up a lot of time by not doing, you know, not watching a lot of TV. Right. So, you know, it also sounds to me like you're not afraid to say, all right, there's somebody else that can do this job, and I'm going to delegate that task to them. You know, do you find that delegating or finding the right person to do that job for you is important? Absolutely. In fact, we, we spend more time on that than we do on anything. Just find, you know, going through finding the right person in a job, and we're not afraid to hire people in for a project or temporary or for permanent to work on something, but you've got to have the right person on the job or, um, or you know, or you're doomed to fail. What about those people out there that say, oh, you know, if you want something done right, you've got to do it yourself. Um, I mean, that's, it sounds nice in theory, but what's your take on that, that, you know, philosophy of doing everything yourself? Well, um, you, you can't. You won't get very much done if you're doing it all yourself. So you, because there, there, you've got limits. Everybody's got limits. Even if you're working 14 hours a day, um, if you know that, that would tell me that your own personal life is out of balance. You're not spending enough time with your family or your friends or playing or relaxing if you're working that hard. There are periods in my life where I did do that and I did get out of balance. But then you can do it for short runs. But to do that for any kind of extended period would be suicide, in my opinion. Um, so you, you really are better off building up a skill where you can train other people. And something I'm working on, you know, bring in somebody and then do a data dump to them of what you really are after and then keep, no, don't be lazy. Don't bring somebody in, tell them what you want to do, and then walk away. And never, you know, you've got to check back every couple of minutes at first, make sure that they're trained properly um, and that they're motivated properly and they're compensated properly and make sure all their pieces are in place so that you can end up where that, resources you know is contributing not not being a hindrance to the to the process but i think so many people i think that saying that you said if you can't do it right then do it yourself comes from the fact that people bring in delegate they bring in somebody and then they don't spend the proper amount of time um you know bringing that person up to speed and training them into a into a valuable resource and i've done that mistake myself many a times you know of hire people and expect that they can just do it and i turn my back on them come back and I'm disappointed in the results and I realize it's really my fault. I could have spent a few more minutes at the beginning, um, you know, going through a few more details on how I like it done and, you know, uh, I would have ended up with a much better uh, trained resource. Right. Matt, we're we're almost out of time and I want to give you time to um, let people know where they can contact you. But one thing I just want to uh, mention because I think it was uh, something that happened recently in an episode that it was very telling about the way that you deal with adversity and the way that you deal with problems as they come up. And it's an episode where I guess you guys were getting ready to do a um, a parade, and you had ordered a gigantic pumpkin inflatable thing. You remember that episode? Uh huh. Yes. Okay. So on the the pumpkin, they spell the name of the farm wrong. They spell your last name Roloff wrong. And as I watching this episode, I'm thinking to myself, God, how many times does this happen to somebody in business? And they throw their hands up and they say, it's ruined. It's over. It's over. And, you know, you go to a commercial break and you come back and the solution is you guys fixed it so that it read right and that it was okay. And it doesn't seem to me, and I know it's a sh- you know the way that the show was, was shot, but it doesn't seem like you missed a beat. Can you talk about that moment for a second when you know you saw the pumpkin and it spelled okay. wrong? Well, it helped to have my genius daughter Molly standing by at that time because she is uh, really, really smart. <laughs> She's the smartest <laughs> of the bunch, and so that was all, that was a nice advantage to have at the time. But the general concept you're describing, you know, happens all the time. Every day there's always setbacks. Everybody is out there listening and in life, you know, have setbacks, and it's all about, again, I'll use the word resiliency, you know, you have to have resiliency and say, hey, I, okay, so this is a setback, I just missed an airplane, or I just got a flat tire on the way to my most important meeting of my life, but I can't sit here and feel sorry for myself, I have got to go into motion, what is my best 
option here. You know, should I get out and hitchhike? Should I start walking? Should I try to change the tire? You know, what am I going to do at an airport? You know, I'm overnight. Well, you, you know, start to call and see if you can reschedule your meeting. Start going to action, going to motion, and um, hope doors open up. Uh, you know, start looking around for those doors to open up. Don't just sit there, though. You know, I'm if I miss an airplane, man, I'm scanning those other boards, looking for other flights that I can switch to. And I'm not thinking, oh, I can't switch to a flight because I've already paid for this one. I'm thinking, I'll go out if it's important enough. You know, I'll put it on my credit card and deal with getting my refund. You know, later that kind of stuff. So, um, you um, you know, you have to be. You have to. That's where the big picture comes in. Is is like, it's spending a little extra money more valuable than the meeting I'm going to be on. Oh, that meeting is pretty important. It could result in, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars with a, with a sale. Well, then why am I going to miss it over a $300 flight, you know? And you have to make those kind of judgment calls. And we haven't talked a lot about judgment, but I think that's an important skill to to have in, have in your arsenal. It's just solid judgment. And that judgment, you know, um, comes from, you know, everything from your DNA and up to your education and your experiences. But I do think people can work on having um, better and better judgment calls. I like to take a lot of my judgment came from early days of playing games in the hospital, you know, where you're making judgment calls on, on the chessboard or on the on the wrist game or on, in Monopoly or checkers, you know. But uh, definitely having good you know, good sound, being able to calculate a lot of factors in the future, in the past, you know, take historical information, future information, and make a decision based on um, on the, your best, uh, you know, neuron, neuron calculation, I guess. Right. Well, you know, if you would be willing, I'd like to have you back on in the future because we had a lot of questions come in during the show that we were unable to get to. Uh, so if, if it's something you're up for, perhaps in the future we can have you back on and we can talk about judgment, and then maybe you can answer some of the questions that uh, some of the listeners have for you. Okay, great. I'm sure definitely have no problem coming back on and talking, and uh, I appreciate you having me on this time, Peter, and I'll say hi to all your listeners out there, and um, I enjoyed your program and um, and look forward to helping you out any way I can. Thank you, Matt. Matt, how can people... Get in touch with you. I mean, obviously, you can Google Matt Roloff, and you're all over the place. But give uh, give some contact information if people want to learn more about you or your businesses. Yeah, the best way we have a website, uh, www.mattroloff.com. I think takes you to our family website, and then you can get a hold of uh, my office if you're looking for speaking or looking for pumpkin. Um, uh, hours or, or when our pumpkin festival happens um, or just the office admin. But we have an office admin. Her name is Karen who takes a lot of calls and, and questions and tries to tries to get to them all. Sometimes it's not always easy, but it's Karen, C-A-R-Y-N, at MattRoloff.com. So C-A-R-Y-N at MattRoloff.com. She is the in-office admin. And then, but just to, the easiest thing to do, um, unless you have a real specific inquiry, is to um, look up the website and see if you can fill out the contact form for the specific uh, area of uh, interest that you have. Um, and that is the mattroloff.com or the rolofffamily.com. So I think I think they both go to the same place. Got it. And we have links on utlradio.com. <laughs> so if you want to go see all the sites, go there or click on the links. Matt, I want to thank you so much for taking the time out, uh, for being on the program, and, and for being willing to come back. I really appreciate it. All right. Well, thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks, Peter. Thanks. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Yes. So we want to thank Matt Roloff. It was, uh, I think, a very informative show. Uh, like I said, those of you who know Matt from Little People Big World who follow the show, uh, you know, you can see what kind of person he is. You can see the success that he's had. And I think a lot of what he talked about today is is something that um, we can learn from as business people. You, know, you look at somebody who has obstacles that are are greater than yours, and you you have to say to yourself, well, they they didn't just it didn't fall in their lap. You know, it's not so simple as um, they got lucky. I don't believe in luck, and and I don't think that most successful people do believe in this notion of luck. I think luck is um, opportunities that present themselves and you being ready to accept those opportunities. So you might have opportunities come fall in your lap, but if you're not ready, 
emotionally, mentally, financially, physically, then those opportunities are going to pass you by and you're going to say, I had bad luck. Well, you've got to be prepared for success. And I think that that's a lot of, of um, personal development and looking into yourself. And if you listen to what Matt said on the show, you know, he talks about the idea of dealing with being different and dealing with adversity at an early age and getting to the point where he is so confident in himself that he can go out on a sales job, deal with being rejected, and understand that it's not him and not feel badly about himself or his product or service. Instead, he looked for ways to make the sale better or the sales pitch better or the product better or the service better. And uh, I think that his positive attitude and his looking for that silver lining in situations that we might consider to be bad, I think is very important for his success because there are many people out there who are fully capable. There's no mental or physical limitations, but you just don't live up to your potential because of a, you know, a variety of factors, including fear and, and failure, you know, the feel of, uh, fear of failure or the fear of success, and then your focus. And Matt's focus is on solving problems, right? He's a problem solver. What you focus on, what you choose to focus on is what is going to direct you, right? Like, so those of you who might play soccer, when you're kicking a soccer ball, um, you, oftentimes you've heard that if you're a right foot kicker, your left foot, where you plant and point your toe, is going to determine in what direction the ball is going to go. I played high school and, and college soccer, and I was a goalie. And, you know, on penalty kicks, you'd be in the net, and you would watch the kicker's you know, plant knee. So whatever foot he was planting with, you'd watch the knee to see what direction the knee was pointed in because that is the direction the ball is going to go. So it's the same thing in business and in life. You know, if your focus, your foot is pointed one direction, that's where you're going to go. So if your mind is pointed in a negative direction and you're focusing on the failure, the fear, the obstacles, the hurdles, you're focused on that in a negative way, what do you think your mind is going to do? Well, it's going to kick that ball in that direction, as opposed to people who think differently. Yes, there's a situation, there's an obstacle, there's a challenge. But don't focus on the difficulty. Focus on the way around it. And I, I gave the example during the program with Matt about... Um, an episode where he he's going to climb this mountain. I don't remember the mountain range. Uh, maybe it was um, in Washington State. I'm not quite sure. But it was this gigantic mountain. And, you know, Matt managed to get up this mountain one step at a time. So he didn't see the mountain, the obstacle, and say, oh, it's too big. I can't do it. Right? Because that's not where his focus was. His focus was on how can I accomplish this? I want it. So how can I accomplish it? And he figured it out, and that's so important for us. You know, don't be afraid to have failure in your life. It's a learning experience. Don't be afraid to have challenge. It's going to make you stronger. If you choose to focus on the way to get around it or over it or to, to, to put it behind you, you know, you focus on a problem in the negative, that's all you're going to do. Your brain shuts down. What was me syndrome sets in, and that's all you're going to be able to do. But if you focus on, all right, there's a challenge here, and I'm not going to let it stop me. I'm going to get over it. I'm, I just have to figure out how. Your brain will find the answers. But you've got to give your brain the opportunity to do so. So uh, I think that, that today was a really great show. I think that there's a lot of lessons we can pick up from Matt. And uh, I am I'm very grateful that he's willing to come back on because we do have a number of questions that came in during the show. And uh, unfortunately, I couldn't get them on because I wanted to uh, go through these main topics with Matt. Anybody who's interested in learning more about Matt, you can head on over to utlradio.com and you'll find all of the links to Matt Roloff's sites on that page. Uh, you can click right through and it'll take you 
to um, to Matt. If you want to speak with him, if you want to hire him to do some motivational speaking or um, you know other lectures for your business or organization, uh, I think there's a lot that can be learned from from Matt. And I, I think that if you look, take a second when you're, you're done with this program, just look him up if you don't know him from the show. Look him up and learn a little bit about him, and I think that it will help you in your business. So a uh, great show, and I think it was a great topic uh, of conversation with Matt today, and I appreciate him being on. I want to remind everybody that next week coming up, we've got Captain Michael Abershaw. He's the former commander of the USS Benfold, and he's going to be talking to us about leadership and uh, the importance of maintaining your crew, if you will, your employees. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Captain Abershoff was in charge of the Benfold, and the Benfold was, at the time he took command, the worst ship in the Navy. And it was it was receiving um, the lowest markings on the tests and, and, and ratings. And Captain Abershoff came, and he implemented new procedures and, and policies. He dealt with employees, right, his shipmates, uh, in a particular way. And by the time he was done with the Benfold, it was the number one ship in the Navy. And, and that's not an easy task to do. So uh, we're going to talk to him. Uh, Captain Abershoff has written an excellent book. It's called It's Your Ship. And it talks about management and leadership uh, and, and how you get your crew to do what needs to be done on your ship. So we're going to talk to him next week. We're excited to have him on. We're going to talk to him about all those topics and, and pick his brain so that we can better understand how to lead our our team, our business, our employees. Uh, so that's um, that's exciting. We've got him coming up. Also, want to remind everybody that the Coat Drive is going to continue for the next few weeks uh, up, up to Christmas. And if you're in the area, um, you know, our New Jersey office is the central collection place for the Coat Drive. So I encourage you to stop by. You can go to our website and go to utlradio.com, and the address is, uh, is there. You can mail, deliver, drop off however you want your coats that goes to an excellent cause. It goes directly to people who need coats in New Jersey. And we appreciate all of you who have donated so far. Um, you know, every year we have a wonderful turnout, and it, it does wonderful things for the community. So we appreciate that. Um, also want to mention to you that we'll be back on live this coming Monday for Week in Review. Uh, we've replayed some old episodes uh, throughout the month of November, but we're back on live this coming Monday with my co-host, Bob Hughes, we're going to be uh, talking about a lot of things because uh, since the last time we, we broadcast live on Week in Review, you know, we've had a number of, of decisions with the police, um, and, and just yesterday we had a decision come down with the, uh, the chokehold case in New York City. So we're going to be talking about all those topics on the news this Monday live, uh, and want to remind everybody that you know, we're coming down to the end of the year, and so we're going to try to do some end-of-the-year wrap-up shows where we can talk about some of the best information that we got from our guests this year uh, on understanding business and talk about some of uh, the most interesting business news stories, legal news stories that we talked about on Week in Review. So what I'm going to ask you guys to do is to contact us, whether it's through social media, Facebook, Twitter, Google+, YouTube, or directly through the website, and let us know what guests you like the most throughout the year, um, You know what information you found most helpful, what news stories you like the most, and then we're going to pull them all together, and we will come up with you know a top five or top ten list, and we will broadcast those shows later on in December, definitely before Christmas. Uh, so you know that's going to be something that you guys have total control over. Think about what shows we aired throughout the year. You know, we had... A ton of guests. We had Fabio Viviani. Uh, we had um, Steve Darnell, which was a great show from uh, Vegas uh, Rat Rods. We had Cord McCoy. We've just so many people this year that we've had who had some excellent, excellent advice, uh, personally and business wise. So go through the list of the shows and tell us which ones you thought were most helpful. Well, we're working on a very good and exciting January. So 
We'll talk about those topics hopefully in the next few weeks so you can get as excited as I am about the guests that we have coming on in January. So uh, look out for that. Make sure you uh, stay uh, updated by going on to utlradio.com and looking at the upcoming guests and seeing what we've got going on. All right, that's going to do it for today. I'd like to thank everybody for listening live or for downloading this later. Remember, go to utlradio.com for all the links to our social media pages. There will also be a uh, video of this podcast. It will be up on our YouTube channel, and you can uh, check that out. Hopefully in the next day or so, we'll have that up for you. Uh, Listen, one more thing. I just want to remind everybody how important it is that we receive your feedback. You know, I want to thank you all uh, for the feedback that you have sent in because it is, is so helpful. It allows us to give you best content and guests possible. And it's, you know, very helpful to me as well to know that what we're doing is something that's of interest to you because that's why we do it. You know, we're doing this for you and to help you in your business and personal life. And so the comments and feedback are so greatly appreciated. I thank you from the bottom of my heart, and I encourage you to continue on with your comments, questions, and feedback because it does make a difference. We do try to respond to each and every comment and piece of feedback left for us. So please continue to do so uh, because we we do appreciate it. Well, that's going to do it. So I want to thank everybody for listening, for downloading. Tune in this Monday for Week in Review Live with myself and my co-host Bob Hughes. And then next Thursday, 10 o'clock, we've got Captain Abershoff, um, and we're going to be talking to him about leadership. So thanks. Remember, guys, that there's power in understanding the law.